Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the press, distinguished guests, it is my utmost pleasure and honor to stand before you today as we embark on an extraordinary journey towards a brighter future for Zimbabwe. My name is Walter Mzembi, Mugabe's last foreign affairs minister and the last man standing during the drama of November 2017. Six years on today, I have the privilege of welcoming you to this historic occasion as we introduce my colleague, Sevia Kasukwere, our SCAD in the 2023 elections. Our destiny has been tied for the last two decades in jubilation as we won several cycles of elections together, in glory as we celebrated different cabinet deployments, in danger as we fled from persecution, in adversity as we lived in exile, and now in our dual calling to rescue our glorious revolution now of the rails in ZANU-PF, our mother party, and in the ultimate calling of serving the people of Zimbabwe and leading them in this exodus from fear to hope. Our local standi in the perennial Zimbabwean question presents us as agents of regeneration and renewal of our revolution and our country. And we are fighting entitlement and family and accolade state capture of our great country and seek to reassert the power of the people as it was in the beginning in 1980 when we were founded as a state. In our great nation's history, there has been remarkable leaders who have fought tirelessly for the empowerment and progress of our people. Today we gather here to present a leader who embodies the spirit of resilience and determination and an unwavering dedication to the Zimbabwean cause. Allow me to share with you some of the notable achievements and qualities of Sevia Kasukwere. Throughout his illustrious career, he has served our nation in various capacities, including his remarkable tenure as Minister of Youth Development and Indigenization and Economic Empowerment. During this time, he was trusted to lead the empowerment agenda for Zimbabwe. He has been Minister of Environment, a portfolio that was very close and dear to me uh, when I was Minister of Tourism. And in this role, he championed the protection of our environment and its integrity. His last deployment before the coup was as Minister of Local Government and Public Housing. And in this assignment that he must complete through the higher office that he has answered to, he had begun to exercise some uh, very serious footsteps in making sure that every Zimbabwean owns their share of housing and real estate in their lifetime. He served as Mugabe's last ZANU-PF National Political Commissar before the events of November 2017. Today, as we stand at the cusp of a new era, Sevia's candidacy symbolizes hope, inspiration, and a renewed sense of purpose for all Zimbabweans. His leadership embodies the voice of the people, echoing their aspirations for a better tomorrow, where opportunities are abundant and the fruits of progress are shared equitably. Thank you, and without further ado, I present to you Sevia Kasukwere, the beacon of hope for Zimbabwe's bright future. Passenger number 34, please come over to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. The passenger who never landed and they remained airborne. Um, colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Chair Walter, for that humbling introduction. 
I want to welcome you all this afternoon as we engage, especially with this very important um, estate in, our, in the world, the media. <clears throat> in journeying with you through what we have, our plans going forward. Allow me at this juncture also to first of all start by extending my gratitude to the people of Zimbabwe, cadres in our party and various structures who have recognized our candidature, who continue to call us and strengthen us in our resolve to tackle the challenges that our country faces. My task today is also to share the political campaign plans that we have with you. Yesterday, we successfully filed my nomination papers to run as an independent presidential candidate in the Zimbabwean general election scheduled for the 23rd of August, 2023. The challenges of Zimbabwe are well known to all of us, and especially to colleagues here in the media. And the major challenge, obviously, is the economic challenge that Zimbabwe faces. But you can't resolve this question without also attending to the politics of Zimbabwe. You're going to get the politics right for you to get the economics right. What is at stake in the forthcoming elections is a stark choice between regeneration and elite capture of the state, its resources, between modernization and regression into the past. Post-2017, November, together we all gave the new dispensation the leadership space to govern, the leadership space to unite our people, the leadership space to provide a new vision and direction for our great country. In his 2018 campaign, Emerson Nanga Gwa promised to deliver health, care for all. The answer is a failure. He promised to create jobs for the youth. I'm not sure if any one young person has been able to get employed in the past five years. He failed. He promised to modernize the railway infrastructure. Up to this day, we're actually seeing bouncers pulling the wagons, meaning that we don't have enough work for those railway systems. He promised to grow our national economy, and nothing has happened. If anything, we have seen the entrenchment of corruption individuals getting richer than the state. He promised to conduct social and security reforms and facilitate Zimbabwe's re-entry into the committee of, of the international community. That, again, he has failed. The very basic responsibility that Nangagwa had as president for the past five years was to improve the lives of the ordinary Zimbabweans. Again, he has failed. This was not only a responsibility, but an opportunity, which unfortunately, he missed not only for himself, but for every Zimbabwean who trusted him and gave him their sacred vote. It is because of this failure by the current leader that I accepted the call to return to Zimbabwe by the people and stand as a presidential candidate. This is what democracy is all about. It is the right for people to stand, to be chosen, or for people to deny you the right to lead their country. It's a time to renew the leadership. Every five years, our country is expected to go through this process. This has been the case since 1980, after the protracted war of liberation. And we want to continue to maintain the democratic nature in our country, in its systems, and in whatever we do. Colleagues, allow me to say again that in this renewal, the leadership of our country 
There comes a time where they must also accept. At 85, you must be thinking, not only thinking, you must have accepted that I've done my part. And the country must be saluting you to say, well done, take a rest. Maybe play golf, visit your grandchildren, write books, write memoirs. Allow the young people to come forward, step forward and rebuild our nation. Let's renew the leadership. Let new ideas flow for our country to come up. Colleagues, it's also time we reconciled our people. This binary, the toxicity in our politics, I think enough is enough. We've had enough of the shouting matches. Hence, we are standing, and I'm standing as an independent presidential candidate, because it has become clear that this binary of political parties has further entrenched the divisions in our society. We need to knit through and build a nation for everyone. Build a nation that is hope for each and everybody. When a child is born in our country, he must know, I'm coming to a world where there is progress, there's unity, and the people are together. A lot has been done against each other. Hatred cannot be the currents of a country. Pain cannot be the currents of a country. There is so much that has happened before independence and after independence. Some of these wounds must be handled with a lot of care, but we must heal our people. Post-independence violence in the Tiberian region, we need to be sincere, engage, and bury those differences. We can't adopt an ostrich mentality. You hide your head and you think people can't see you. We've got to be genuine so that at least people come forward and we all work in one direction. Colleagues, we have seen these waves of violence continue in each and every other process in terms of our elections, where political differences rear that ugly head, violence also comes in. We've got to put a stop to this. Let us say, let bygones be bygones, but let's also accept that we have a responsibility as a leadership not to allow our country to go down the whole because of violence. Its impact on families, the survivors, is unimaginable. Those who were brought down in August 2018, to this day, we have not done anything for those families. 2019, nothing has been done for their families, let alone the sorry, as said by President Montlandi. So I am saying, to get Zimbabwe out of this dungeon, we've got to be genuine with each other. Let's reconcile our differences. There's more that we can benefit together as Zimbabweans if we work together. We can't, and I must stress, make hatred the currency. Nobody develops because I hate Walter Mzembe. What can help us is the unit of purpose to move our country forward. Colleagues, it is also time we reformed our state institutions. Our state institutions must deliver for each and every citizen. Zimbabweans pay their taxes because those institutions are so important in their livelihoods. And we expect those institutions to serve beyond the call of partisanship. We expect those institutions to be above board, to be run by men and women of integrity who believe in their country that I have a responsibility not to an individual but to the greater society, to the greater majority of our people. Be it in the judiciary, be it in the defense forces, be it in the police, be it at the hospital, across the length and breadth of our country, we must have institutions that serve our people of Zimbabwe. Colleagues, the state of our economy has rendered a lot of our people 
to become destitute. The state of our economy has pushed a number of our citizens beyond our borders. Some have gone to the Americas. Some have gone to Europe. Some in the region. Highly educated Zimbabweans with great skills have left our country and to try and seek life beyond their borders. I've been discussing with my colleague, Dr. Mzembi. I said to him, Dr. Mzembi, as I embark on the campaign in Zimbabwe, please start working on an architecture of how we can bring back the skilled manpower in Zimbabwe. That is beyond our borders. Let's work on a plan of the journey back to Canaan of many of our citizens so that they come and make a contribution to their beloved country. We are not in any way minimizing what they are doing beyond their borders, wherever they are in South Africa, but also recognize the pain that many of them go through on a daily basis. Hence, we have taken this step to put our hand up and say, we are in the election, we are going to participate in these elections, whether we survive or we die, it will not be in vain. We want to bring together all the Zimbabweans, form a government of national unity that is aiming at only one objective, get Zimbabwe out of the hoods, get Zimbabwe out of the dungeon. Let us build an economy, an inclusive economy. Let's resolve the challenges of isolation, the challenges of sanctions, so that we give our economy a chance to survive. This can be done by a people with a vision. We want to see young people in our country having hope, where they can write application letters and say, I beg to apply for a job. I beg to apply to become a member of your institution. And they can also start earning a decent salary. We now have a country where each and everybody, young people as they come up, they think willing and dealing is the art of survival. We need to put that beyond us, in fact, behind us, and start creating conditions where there is a future, there is stability and hope for each and every young person as they come up. In so doing, also saying as we revive our economy, is the economy is not for a cabal. The economy cannot be held ransom by a few people. Let's open up. Let us do away with the cartels. Allow more citizens to have a play. Because I'm not part of your team, therefore you can't exploit the lithium in my country, in our country. Because you don't support me, you therefore don't qualify to benefit from such and such resources available in our country. No. So we will be engaging with business because we want business to thrive. We also want to ensure that in this process of building a sustainable economy, our people come first. Zimbabweans must bear the core face of helping in the revival of a country. You can't subcontract that responsibility to any other nationality. Let's welcome those who come to our country to work with us, but we also expect maximum contribution to work, work ethic of our own people as Zimbabweans to make a difference. Colleagues, the economy, the economy, the economy remains the generational responsibility that we must now tackle. Every generation must define itself. Either you fail or you succeed. We can only determine and see what type of a generation you were if you fail on this duty today, which is to say build an economy that will stand years after you are gone. If you fail in that responsibility, shame on us. So we want an economy where we leave nobody behind. Every Zimbabwean is entitled to play their part in building our economy. 
in their fields of endeavor, either in arts and sports. Let's see Zimbabweans flourish. Let's get our nation back again to basics. And my call in terms of economic, the economic challenge, the young people for our country must get engaged. We have lost generations due to drug and substance abuse. Many young people today spend their days and time sniffing glue, taking hard substances to while up time. But what are we doing? We're actually de destroying this huge resource and potential that we have. So the economy, the economy, and the economy, that is where the challenge is. And we want to stress that it is the farmer, it is the miner, it is the manufacturer who must now carry the button. Let's get more industries working. Let's get young people involved in mining. Let's have institutions that we fix to serve and train our young people. We want to see the, the equal amount of agricultural colleges we have in our country. They must be, again, have an equal amount of mining training institutions to give our young people to participate in extracting that resource. Yes, we welcome foreigners to our country, but we'll be even more happier if our only young people get to grips with this responsibility. And the state must facilitate that. I say so because I think there's a lot on our statute books that we must look at. Just a few weeks ago, our parliament was busy working on the patriotic bill. Now, you don't buy patriotism. You don't legislate for somebody to be a patriot. Let's revise, let's review the Mines and Minerals Act. What does it say about the small-scale miner? You spend five years writing a law to say, don't speak when you're outside the country. When you're actually sitting on a piece of paper legislation that is impoverishing your people, legislators must be a bit more serious. And I hope and trust that this next legislation, next legislature, will both men and women who look at the future and note how much you can punish your own fellow citizens. Colleagues, lastly, we must rebuild our economy. We must rebuild our infrastructure, our dams, our power stations, <clears throat> our roads and rail networks. So we unleash the great potential in our society and our people. This is not going to be a journey that's going to be easy. We're not doing it because it's easy. <coughs> we are doing it because we believe in the cause. Thank you very much. I'm directed by the communications director that will field questions um, inside this room but they will not be exclusives. So we'll field questions from where we are, uh, but they will not be exclusives one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, please just uh, take uh, note of that. Uh, and with this, I think we can shoot. Thank you. Uh, hi, good day, sir. It's Kaili Shekumala here from SABC News. I just want to get your sense, sir, especially in light of yesterday where we saw the nomination court uh, busy with uh, the presidential candidate, but also, you know, we saw that you were not present in Zimbabwe because of uh, the fears that you might be incarcerated. Well, what do you make of that, especially ahead of the elections? But also, something that you mentioned about post-election violence, how concerned are you about the atmosphere in Zimbabwe in terms of making sure that, you know, candidates are able to campaign freely without any obstruction. Thank you so much. Do you want us to respond to one question at a time or we'll take three and three and answer if there is only question. 
explicit. Okay. Seeing, so yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kumalo, for that question. Yes, we have to take security issues into consideration. You don't board the plane as passenger 34 and just rock up without uh, doing some preparatory work. We did exactly that to see the reaction and very interesting results came our way. But we trust that uh, now that we're in election period, you can't weaponize institutions against your opponents. I'm sure this is an election that everybody wants to proceed smoothly so that the outcome is not contested, so that we allow our country to be back on the international stage and we the participants and contestants are all able to say this was a good election with a good fight, but at the end of the day, we are still brothers and sisters. So yes, we are concerned, we are still very concerned, and we will be raising these issues with the relevant institutions. We have our SADAC body, we have uh, the mediation, the monitoring teams that will be coming to our country. It's important that every contestant is protected, is secure. Now what we have in Zimbabwe is a caretaker president. We are all equal now. The only day that will have a difference between myself, Nanga Gwai, and Chamisa, I don't know the others, but uh, these other two, I think they are somewhere behind my numbers. Um, is after the 23rd of August. After counting, and somebody has emerged, and we know we'll be emerging very strong. Then we can start arresting others, if you want to arrest others. But the game is not about arresting people. Let's go to the ground and campaign. Let's tell the people what we can do or that which we can't do. The question of post-election violence, again, it is how we conduct ourselves from day one that will determine what happens at the end. Let's ensure that there is fairness. My appeal is to the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, which is a very important responsibility of conducting our elections, to do so honorably. <coughs> Your third question again was on candidates. Kumalo? What I've answered you. Okay. Maybe just an uh, educational question. So you currently here in South Africa. Uh, are you so you're currently here in South Africa. Are, are you perhaps campaigning here, but also? No, no, no. You uh -huh. can't come in from South Africa. Okay. Uh, South Africa is not uh, in an election uh, season. In South Africa, we'll have its elections next year. So if I'm going to be invited to come and campaign for some friends or so, well, I'll come and do that. But we'll be, I am on my way to Zimbabwe. I'm going to be in Harare and visit each and every district in my country. That is where my campaign will be. We will soon be launching our main campaign in Harare, in Zimbabwe. That's where the game begins. So we're here, obviously, for other issues that we have raised before. But we are not dated. We are going back to our country. We have to make a difference in our country. We have to fight the elections in our country. That's what we're going to be doing. Thank you. Um, my name is Sipema Tigizela, and I'm an activist. So I've got two questions for you, but I think you'll be able to answer them as one. First, you said that you do not believe that Nangwanga had created any, emp any employment for the youth. And when you were minister for youth and development, do you have any statistics or where we can see whether the youth unemployment increased or decreased in Zimbabwe during that, 
during that period? And how are you going to encourage Zimbabweans who are possibly here in South Africa to go out and vote, especially the youth? Thank you. Thank you, my sister. Um, yes, indeed. You look at any government, it must be very clear in terms of its commitment to the development of the youth. During our time, we created opportunities for the youth. We put up funds, youth funds, almost over 100 million US dollars for young people to pursue their endeavors in the various fields of endeavor. We did that, and I know that we created loads and loads, thousands and thousands of opportunities as well as jobs. In fact, today the young people and women who are driving our economy, the middle age, are mainly recipients of what my government then, or my ministry did, to empower and assist. We created an enabling environment in terms of the legislation. We ensure that young people have access to land. We ensure that young people have access to tenders. We ensure that the training that was being done was conducted in a manner that also looked at a, a wholesome, inclusive process that brought in even people from the rural areas. We set up funds which were accessed by young people in all our 10 provinces. Now, if you look at today, they have not set up even one, save for the Minister of Finance to now start running around going in Matebele land in Blawayo, setting up Red Cross training programs. Now, that's not empowerment. You're actually creating people who have to leave the country to go to London. Who has fainted? Who are you trying to deal with? What are you trying to deal with? The Minister of Finance must have been in the forefront of setting up a funding mechanism to give our young people hope and an opportunity to get themselves involved in the economy. There is a Minister of Youth today who actually has done, sorry for saying this to my good friend Kirsty, it's been a very tough responsibility for her. She has actually done absolutely nothing. Nice young girl, but she doesn't understand what has to be done. We're talking about a hard hit area where you need people who work hard, who roll their sleeves and get the young people, the youth, out of the streets. Now look at the numbers in terms of drug abuse, substance abuse. It's been creeping up because there's been no concomitant support for young people by the state. So if ministers can have $500,000 facility for homes, each minister and devote 30 ministers, why not have those funds set aside for each and every province to empower young people? If you can give a house to somebody who's 65 years old to pay a mortgage, at what point will that person be able to complete that mortgage? Rather give that facility to young people. That's what we did. So this is a major difference, and I'm saying on that score, yes, Nagagwa has failed. He has no knowledge of how to do it. And to look at how even the processes are going on, where just a few well-connected friends are making it, taking over all of the resources, his children, running around the country. Wherever there is a gold opportunity that has been discovered, they must be involved. Now, we're not going to have that. We're going not to have that. We take a grave exception to that kind of behavior. The country belongs to all of us. And everybody must have an equal opportunity. So we are saying let's cast away fear and embrace hope. Hope is not an easy thing to do, but it is that which makes women bear children. It is that which makes farmers grow crops. If they had no hopes, they will not be able to do what they're doing. So we are planting the seed of hope in our society, especially also among the young people, to move them forward. And this also goes to those Zimbabweans who are in the diaspora, who are in South Africa. Clearly, we want them back home, and they'll have to be back home. At times, they're running battles, fighting groups who are saying these people must get out of our country. They are not here because they love to be here. They are here because of the circumstances. So we have any responsibility as a leadership to try and assist in creating opportunities for our people to also succeed in the countryside. 
Why is it that it's only Zimbabweans who are in Malawi, who are in Zambia, who are in South Africa, who are in Mozambique, who are in each and every restaurant? I haven't seen a South African in our restaurants except those who are visiting or bringing their musical teams in Zimbabwe. It's because something is happening for your people here. We want to do exactly the same because we can't allow this kind of shame to continue on our people. We are a very proud people, actually. And we need to actually start doing the right thing to ensure our people live better lives. Exhausted. I see my brother there is using it. You go ahead, my brother. Sure. Okay. Okay. Maybe just the last one for me, sir. Also, you spoke about bringing back the Zimbabweans who are scattered all over the world to come back and contribute in terms of reviving the economy. How are you going to make sure that succeeds, you know, in terms of making sure that they rally behind you and support you in this regard? Thank you. I have asked my colleague, my running mate, if... Uh, we adopt the American system, which is a very good one, because one of the problems in Africa is this unclear process of succession. If I drop dead, don't go to Nganga's or somewhere to look for who he must come in. We have to be that clear so that at least there is no doubt about what we are trying to do as young people. Those Zimbabweans, I've said, Comrade Mzembe, will start, in fact, he's already been working on a diaspora policy to see what can be done, one in terms of voting. My sister, you raised that question, I'm sorry, I'd forgotten it, about getting Zimbabweans to participate. We are going to be arranging almost about 500 buses or so to transport Zimbabweans to come and vote in the next elections on the 23rd. Secondly, Dr. Mzembe has a very able team which is working with to create a database of Zimbabweans from various stations in life to bring forth the ideas and hopefully to be part and parcel of those who will also come in to jumpstart our economy and bring those skills that they've acquired. I think it's a very painful exercise for any country to spend millions of dollars or thousands of dollars yearly on our young people, on individuals, but after graduating, they leave the country to go and work elsewhere. Now, that kind of investment is a lost investment. So as we invest in our education, we must be clear that these resources that we have built in our country will also be used to grow our economy. So it is important that and imperative that Dr. Mzembe works on this plan and which plan I'm sure he will do and successfully execute. He actually was one of the key players who crafted our diaspora policy when he was environment minister we brought back a number of Zimbabwean skilled persons then, and we also went on to grow our tourism industry from merely about millions to billion turnover, almost about seven billion, if I'm not mistaken, on an annual basis because tourism was then pumping in Zimbabwe. So we know we have a very, very able team. Ministers who were appointed by President Mugabe, for your information, 60% of them were around 40 years old. And that's why November 2017 was dismantling that architecture to try and bring in, I think, this entitlement culture. Those who had not eaten wanted to eat. We are saying, fine, I'm sure five years you have eaten enough. Can we now start ensuring that everybody eats? Well, I think there's one last question. Okay, one last question from me. Um, you said something which caught my ear, is that you believe that young people should be sitting in leadership and in parliament. And the former President Mugabe was in president for, I think, 40 years or so. What is your stance on that? And should you become president, would you want to be in office for so long? Even if I wanted to be, the Constitution doesn't allow. 
we are limited to two terms. But we also have become students of history. We have seen the problems with overstaying your welcome, which happened then. But President Mugabe's circumstances must also be understood within a context. They were questions of the liberation war that had not been finished. We urged him on to complete the task of the land reform program. He often would say that even the ledger Shankomo said, Robert, I'm now dying. But I want you to complete this journey. The land must come back to the people of Zimbabwe. And he did that. Perhaps it was the best to do that. Because we have seen some of them, many, many, shaking, talking too many numbers, billions of dollars to compensate this to do that. We wanted to be clear that the land belonged to the people of Zimbabwe. So that they also become part and parcel of the economy, because the land is the economy, and the economy is your land. His age factor agreed. One thing I, ac I must accept, he was old, but his mind was very young. He was smart. He was well read. He kept himself abreast, and he knew exactly what must be done. But politics being politics, he stayed on for a bit, just too long, but what I know, and from discussions I had with him, in August 2017, for over seven hours, we, the two of us sat together. He said, Kasukwere, I'm on my way out. I now want to rest. I've done my part. We wanted President Mugabe to go in dignity. That's where we have a major departure within the party. We can't allow any leader to be humiliated. We grew up in the youth league. We know what it means to be disciplined members of a, and cadres of a movement. One thing you don't do is when you have a leader, you abuse him, you dump him. That becomes a chronic and recurring process. That becomes very embarrassing for a country. When a leader has done his part, treat him with respect and let him rest. Because there is no leader without supporters. If you treat him badly, and the reacts also, he can cause disturbance in the country. So we felt President Mugabe deserved an honorable exit. He had done a good job, albeit he had overstayed a bit, but he had to be respected. He was the founding father of our country. We don't like how he was treated. We don't like how he was buried. We don't like where he died. For once he said, here I was born, here I shall die, and here I shall be buried. He believed in his country. He believed that he was a Zimbabwean and had fought for it. We will respect Komen Mnangagwa. Mnangagwa will respect him. We will respect the generals, those who have served our country with dignity. We want to ensure that we respect and retain their dignity. But the country must move forward. So the young people must come in in parliament. Young people must come in government. Look at the Rwandese government. President Kagame has with him 40-year-olds, 50-year-olds. When you're at 60, you must be talking about a pension. My brother is getting close to the sixth floor, so I'm sure he will start uh, getting ready for it. He will be offloaded. But you can't want to drive a process at eight years. I mean, it's just unacceptable. Even the body doesn't allow it. Why are you pushing yourself? You want to just be known as, it's even better to be a respected statesman at over 80 than one who gets dragged out of the office by the people. And this is essential in terms of communicating to our leadership and to those who are in offices. When they leave, they must live with the respect. When, how we treat them is also important as citizens. Let's give them the respect. But don't overstay your welcome because you'll be hurt. If we retire our people most of the time, 65, everyone becomes a pensioner. Now, when you're at 85, you're 20 years into extra time. You've been soccer or golf. You don't get that much time. So we want Zimbabwe now, parliament, institutions, the boards, the civil service, to be run by an efficient, 
and the young generation. This generation which can't use computers, which still believes in long handwriting, must go and write their memoirs and allow the youngsters also to come up. This is not, it's not an individual's decision to say, I just want to remain in charge of this country. It is a collective responsibility. So if you have done your part, you have been in the war, you have been in government for 40 years, comrade, you have done very well. Thank you very much for your service. We really, really like to thank you very much. But it's time up. We have to call the umpire. The referee has to say, ah, the game is over. Let's move on. So thank you very much. Um, I'm sure in the ensuing days before the candidate 34 or passenger 34 embarks on the journey back home, you will be having your opportunities for one-on-ones. But for today, we wanted to just fill the questions here and um, with your gracious permission, allow us to now uh, depart. I'm your convening chair, uh, Dr. Oldham Zembi, and um, blessed day to all of you. Thank you.